Ooh. Oh, so I think we are live now. I think we are. Um, got the little red button, so I think that means that we're live. Um, so if everyone can hear me, um, welcome to the Blueprint for the Future panel uh, with Youth Music. Uh, Youth Music are a national charity. They invest in music making projects that support children and young people age uh, up to 25 and help them to develop personally and socially as well as musically. Um, in the panel, we'll be discussing the Blueprint for the Future, which is a report that explores through the voices of young people how current routes for them to move from education to employment are not fit for purpose and uh, sets out a positive vision for change that's centred on the power of supporting and cultivating young creatives across the music industry, which is why we have a selection of young creatives uh, with us today. Um, so first, I'd like to ask everyone to introduce themselves, if that's okay. So starting with Louise. Hi, uh, so yeah, my name's Louise. Uh, I work for Youth Music, who, like Lee said, are a funding body and we support music making projects for young people. Um, and my role is to manage our portfolio of projects up in the Northeast and in Yorkshire as well. Sick. Uh, George? Uh, I'm George. I've done some freelance work with Youth Music and I also uh, play in a band based in Newcastle. Oh, Shante? Uh, hi, I'm a singer-songwriter and I'm currently working with Launchpad and Come Play With Me. Uh, Leone? Hi, I'm Leone. I am the singer of uh, my band Leo and I also work freelance at an organisation in Doncaster called Higher Rhythm um, on a youth music project, actually. <laughs> Fabulous. And finally, Bailey. Hi, folks. Uh, my name's Bailey. I... What do I do? I run a radio <laughs> station where I co-founded with someone called Aura called Sable Radio in Leeds and do kind of like lots of sound engineering, film, kind of art direction program and stuff on the side. So everyone's kind of got an uh, involvement in youth music. Um, and yeah, so I am Lily Fontaine. Um, I am in the Leeds band English Teacher. Uh, I play guitar and sing in that and I'm also in a band called Eads and I am a music writer and I write for youth music sometimes which is really nice. Um, so that's all of us. Um, so a little bit now about the convention. So the Yorkshire Music Forum convention is produced by Yorkshire Music Forum Consortium which is Can Play With Me, DMF Digital, High Rhythm, Arnold Brown Limited and Music Leads and it's in collaboration with Launchpad. Um, Yorkshire Music Forum is a PRS Foundation talent development partner and the event is supported by the BPI as well as Youth Music, which is awesome, with public funding from the National Lottery through Arts Council England, Leeds 2023, Arts Leeds and Leeds City Council with Launchpad. Um, before we start, um, I think it's really important everyone knows that you can find out about all the other talks happening as part of this year's convention through the links that are going to be in the comments. Um, definitely check them out because I watched the ones that were earlier in the programming and they were really good. Um, and also closed captioning is available if you watch through the Launchpad Facebook page. Um, and also uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna have like 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, please just drop them in the comments and then we'll try our best to like answer as many as possible. So there's a lot to cover with the report, isn't there? <laughs> um, so should we get on with some questions? Um, the first one that we've got prepped. So there's a, um, there's a quote from the, the report that says that there's a lack of information available in schools and the HE system about how big the UK music industry is and the diversity of job roles within it. And I just wanted to ask if we remember learning about the wider music industry roles when we were younger, or if that's something that um, we've had to sort of discover as we've grown up. Um, so, should we start with Bailey? I'll mute myself, probably best. <laughs> um, yeah, did I hear about? No, not really. Mm. Um, I never kind of went. Yeah, never kind of had an exposure to a lot of the different kind of um, careers possible. Right through to uni, I studied politics and like obviously mm -hmm. anyone that's been to uni, I'm sure there's similar things in college, but like job fairs and stuff, it's like law firms, mm -hmm. solicitors, the RAF, 
and like very little in the way of like creative things. So yeah, um, in a nutshell, not really, didn't really have much exposure to. Mm-hmm. Um, George? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember when I was in school and sometimes musicians would come in and you would learn a lot about the performance side. And I think that's one of the issues with the curriculum as well is that curriculum is entirely performance based. And what you get is people who are passionate about the industry, want to you know develop a career in it, but they haven't learned about PRs, the roles of record, roles of record labels, anything like that. So I think that's a massive issue on the curriculum side of things too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's something that I definitely feel like, and it was in the report as well. Is like um, the, a lot of it is focused on the sort of the performance side of things, and there's a whole world out there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, I think um, it yeah. seems really scary as well. If you, if you haven't, if you don't know anything about it, it seems like this impossible to tackle, terrifying beast. Yeah. Nothing. What everyone who goes through school on to be in the music industry is faced with, not knowing what the industry is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, Louise, like, how have you experienced it? Um, similar to George, really. I mean, I remember Status Quo came and played at my primary school. Yeah. And I remember wow. that. That was the closest we got to any kind of visits or anything like that from artists or, or kind of music industry experts or anything like that. Um, I probably didn't get any kind of careers advice whatsoever and, well, at all and like during my time in education through school or university or anything like that. Um, if anything, I think in the school that I went to, I won't name it, uh, but <laughs> I feel like the kind of arts and music sort of subjects just weren't encouraged at all. And they were sort of seen as something that you could pursue as a hobby um, and that it wasn't something kind of tangible that you could, you know, make a career from, especially not in the northeast. Mm-hmm. And I imagine the same, you know, was probably the case for Yorkshire as well. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't actually, in hindsight, I sort of don't blame the teachers for that because... <sighs> If you're trying to give career advice to young people, you've then got to have your foot in the door of so many different industries. And unless you've got a music teacher that's really, really engaged with the wider music industry in the area that you live in, chances are they're not going to be in a position themselves to know what those opportunities are. So it was only really once I kind of left education that I realised, and by this point I was 21, and actually working in music music education, that I realised that music education existed. Um, yeah. So it's only really been sort of through work that I kind of accidentally stumbled upon a career in music education, um, but it was all a little bit too little, too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sort of stumbling upon the education, the career thing is definitely something I can I can relate to. Leonie, do you do you, is this the same for you? Um, yeah, so I, I'm i from the Netherlands, so I've got a slightly different country perspective, actually. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. I went to school in Belgium and the Netherlands. So I did primary school, Netherlands, high school, Belgium, uni, Netherlands. Um, and I, I was lucky enough that my parents kind of indulged me in all the thousands of instruments that I wanted to learn how to play when I was uh, because I just, I can't remember how many I tried and didn't pursue but I had zero music education in school um I think we had two years of a bit of drawing and a bit of singing a song together but that was it I never I didn't learn anything in school or there wasn't really spoken about music education in schools at all um it was in a way seen as something you could pursue as further education but it was never spoken about as a real option um same as louise it was just seen as a hobby something you do on the side whilst you work on your career mm-hmm. um, so i i studied law which <laughs> made me chuckle when bailey started talking about lawyers and solicitors <laughs> at the job fairs mm-hmm. because it is true um when you go to job fairs or even university fairs there's barely any focus on music education um and any realism about what you can really do with it. Um, I feel like, especially in schools, music is taken seriously when you get famous or when you go to idols or X Factor and are successful and win, then then it matters. But anything outside of that is never taken seriously and is kind of seen as, oh yeah, she's just enjoying it, isn't she? So mm-hmm. that would, like even in, a different country it's still the same that's interesting that it's, it's not just you know um 
focused on here, but yeah, it's the same other places. And, and same, Shanti, same question. What was your experience of that? <clears throat> I think it's pretty similar to everyone else's. I think because the success rate of making it really big time is so low, it's not seen as like a viable career to pursue because everyone only looks at like the top end mm -hmm. and then they just don't teach you the business side. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of that business side, isn't there? There's so many other it's, layers yeah, of like, it. When you're looking in just beginning, it seems like hopeless to begin. Like, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's why it's good. There's like um, organisations like this, I guess, and like um, like Launchpad and, and like Youth Music. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I think that kind of leads on quite well into the next question because, um, you know, a couple of you were saying about like, how you trained in other things so Leonie you said that you were training in law and Bailey you studied other things and and you know everyone's in different parts of the industry and um and so the next thing that I really wanted to talk about is that um that sort of like multiple skills element because in the in the report it said um that future creative industry workers will need to be equipped with a fusion of creative design tech entrepreneurial skills alongside transferable skills for life and so like my next question is like what is your experience with managing um these multiple skills multiple income streams do you think having a portfolio career having multiple income streams is necessary and do you have any advice for people if um they want to get into having that kind of career um to start with oh i don't know i don't like having to pick someone new every time <laughs> uh louise go on do you want to go first <laughs> It's funny because it, this this kind of idea of like a DIY generation came out in the report quite a lot and we're hearing a lot that young people were just having to figure everything out for themselves. Um, you know, there was an example, we did a Q&A um, and one of the arts in the Q&A, it was a singer and she was sort of talking about having to learn Photoshop and like styling and, try, you know, to tr do everything herself basically. And that skills acquisition isn't a bad thing, but it's a time luxury. And if you're having to work a bar job and you're writing music and you're trying to rehearse and maybe you're studying or maybe you've got care roles to think about as well, the first thing that's probably going to go is the artistic stuff and the skills development stuff. So it's something that we heard kind of a lot uh, coming through the report. In terms of like my own experience I mean I'm not an artist I used to play a lot of instruments when I was younger but I'm not an artist now um, and it's something that doesn't seem to have got much better in terms mm -hmm. of young people understanding what the options are what you know what options are available to them mm -hmm. um, so you know I live in London now and work for youth music but before that I worked on a project um, up in Newcastle and it was really interesting because we'd hear from like local music and creative industries there's a massive skills gap but like, there's no young people here to, to take these jobs and what i was hearing from young people was you know there's, there's no opportunities for us mm -hmm. uh and there was just this massive disconnect between the two this isn't really answering your question i'm kind of aware of this but one of the things that yeah. <laughs> we, we did quite a lot of is we'd go into schools and sort of say you know to like a year nine music class um you know what do you want to be when you're older and none of them said they wanted to be a musician and none of them said that they wanted to have a job in the music industry and this is one class of like 30 kids in one school so I'm aware this isn't like gospel and I was like but you're all studying music you all love music why don't any of you want to do this for a living and they're like well because we can't and that was just a massive kind of alarm bell for me for how kind of removed the industry is from young people yeah idea of making a living just isn't feasible so we talked a lot about like and bear in mind like year nine you, you're young in year nine so you don't you don't know what's available but we talked about all the different music venues that were in the northeast all the different recording studios um and looked at how many different roles would be needed to make a gig happen to make a tour happen and suddenly they were like, oh, I could be a tour, like a tour manager as a thing. Oh, I could do that in the Northeast. Oh, I could manage a band. Oh, I could work in a and I could run a venue. So, like I say, this is a slight deviation because I don't have that experience of being an artist and yeah. um, trying to balance a career. But suddenly this idea that they could still pursue music and make a living from it, mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. maybe still studying, suddenly and do it in their hometown became a bit of reality. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that missing um 
yeah definitely I think that um like I didn't realize that how many different jobs there were in the I always knew I wanted to work in the music industry um but I thought that there was just sort of the performance and then backstage but then when you learn about you know like PR and you learn about um you know radio and everything suddenly there's you know there's an actual way of earning money from it um um so should we go to uh george next um uh, i'll give you a reminder of the question if you want or <laughs> can't remember uh, yeah yeah go for it go for it i mean it was to do with um wh whether developing a portfolio is necessary in yeah business. yeah yeah so yeah i mean i would mostly especially um regarding the, the things you touched on last about the breadth of opportunity in the music industry um i think what very my experience when i was when i was a lot younger and i got my first uh, job which was working for a small record label and a radio station and um, the thing that my mentor encouraged me to do was to do exactly that and to develop a portfolio um as many strings my bow as possible and I, I remember thinking i only want to i only want to be an artist or i only want to do a and r um so i turned on opportunities to learn like radio skills and stuff and it's only as i've gotten older i've realized that it's so important to get as many of these skills as possible because in the situation we have at the minute with the bottlenecking of number of jobs compared to the people who want jobs um really the more bows you have to your strings you have to, to your bow the better because you know there, there's so many opportunities that um it, it, it's obviously so difficult to get a job in the industry at the minute and you know you, you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you don't develop a portfolio in that way mm -hmm. yeah definitely and like um same to bailey because you do quite a few different things like um do you feel like having multiple skills is important for this kind of this kind of career yeah i don't know um i think i kind of do it that way because mm -hmm. i like it and i don't kind of touching on what louise was saying i, I don't particularly want to like valorize like a mm -hmm. diy culture like i think it should be something that's optional yeah. rather than people forced in to do it because like they don't have the luxury and they're like i mean they're learning yeah. adobe at like 1 a.m having worked that bar shift and that gig and do you know what i mean so yeah uh but yeah that said um yeah, I kind of do have do do quite a lot of different things like jack of all trades, <laughs> no, master sure of none. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of it's been it's been interesting the last few months because like the radio is still fairly uh, like nascent, like a year and a half, two years old, and trying to work out like income streams. And like I probably wouldn't have put such an emphasis on like live streaming tech support, but then actually we had a few cameras. Which, I mean, come March and then. If you have a few cameras in March, then like people start hitting you up for live streaming jobs. And yeah, now we're kind of, it's kind of like a main mm. source of income for the radio as well. So uh, yeah, I mm. guess just flexibility. But No, I think it's interesting that you said that about, um, you know, it not being like the only way to do things. Like, cause it's not, it's not for everyone, is it? To, to, to sort of live, live like that, but it's definitely useful um, if that's what you enjoy to, to have mm -hmm. different income streams and different, things like that um same to you Leone how, how have you experienced it are you um multi-skilled <laughs> I'm sure you are but <laughs> I guess yes um uh, yeah kind of to to repeat what Bailey has said as well like I I enjoy doing many different things uh, sometimes I shoot myself in the foot with it because I take on too many things that are exciting but I I think over the years I've realized that one of my worst nightmares would be to be in a nine to five. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a nine to five if it's a nice one, but I like to diversify my, my income streams because I like to work on music one day. I work on teaching the other day, work on project management another day um, because it kind of, it keeps things fresh. Um, but also it, it keeps things exciting i guess um not to say not to discount the fact that i do think it's necessary if you are in the music industry because on um, unless you get to a certain point in your career i guess where you are quote unquote famous it's really hard to make money with one thing especially if you're a performing artist um performing original music i i think it's and for function bands it's different for wedding bands um but if you perform your own original music and you have to sell tickets for everything it's really hard to get to that point where you actually make 
a sustainable income. Like I know bands who, on the face of it, sell out massive venues, but will still have a side job when they're not touring because when you're not touring, your income dries up if you are the touring. So um, I think there's a lot of value in a portfolio career. And I, I've kind of been thinking about this a lot over the past few years when I actually quit my full-time job and to pursue music and to really figure out how it works. Still haven't figured it out, but um, <laughs> I think I've realized that there's there seems to be this really big misunderstanding of the music industry being so much more difficult to succeed in than other industries. Um, I think people still have this mindset of you do your school, you go to uni, you find a job. And especially our generation is getting very aware of the fact that that's not really the case. Like you don't necessarily get a job because there's not as many jobs out there as there are people, I guess. And then there's the skills gap and all that kind of stuff that really can withhold you from getting an, e an easy job. So looking at a music career from a point of view of, oh, you want a stable income, I think that is a very difficult thing to achieve with one thing, but I don't think it's that much harder than other industries, depending on what you're looking for, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. so doing different things and building your portfolio, building your CV will help you achieve the income that you need, but also will help you kind of figure out what you what it is that you actually want to do. Um, because I'm turning 28 this weekend and I still don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I didn't know this when I was 17 and went to uni. I'm 28 now. <laughs> no, so giving yourself all the opportunity where you can and where you have that space. I know that not everyone can do it, but if you can, do it with both hands and build your portfolio, build your skills, build your knowledge, um, meet people, get to know people, um, so I think that networking is incredibly important for that as well. I, I've had opportunities come up because I talk to people and I'm nice, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so that's definitely something that you should pursue, especially at the start of your career, because it's hard, yeah, to enter the music industry thinking, yes, I'm here, I've got mm -hmm. a because most of mm -hmm. us have is um and i'll i won't go on for too long but i i was talking yes, yeah i had a, a sort of business mentoring session and the guy i had it with just said something really something that stuck with me and i've been really focusing on this year to find side jobs or freelance jobs that help your career um i see a lot of musicians who pursue their career who feel stuck in a bar job or who think this is what I should be doing because the grind and stuff like that but it doesn't have to be like that I think setting your boundaries of how much sleep you need um how much money you need and really realistically looking at what you need and how you can achieve that will really help you focus on on your career mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. that doesn't mean that you don't have to work a bar job that you hate for 10 years. If you love the bar job, do the bar job. But if you hate it, there are possibilities out there that you can explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good advice for people that are looking into doing that portfolio career because there are lots of different ways of, of earning money on the side um, that are that could also upskill you um, in ways that you don't even realise you, you will benefit you in your your career that you want to do um so and uh, finally Shante um as a musician have you felt that you you've had to upskill in other areas apart from performance <clears throat> um first and foremost a singer and that's always been my passion but in today's climate it's a lot easier if you diversify mm -hmm. and are adaptable mm -hmm. but also recognizing that this is a career that's hard enough if you love it. So don't do things that you hate just because you feel like it's necessary. Like, 
prioritise your own mental health and like making sure you're doing it because you still love it. So don't take the passion out of it by doing the things in like, for me, I'm not the best at like social media, which is definitely necessary for like advertising your music. But I've over this lockdown period, I've learned that like taking the priority off of that and taking the creativity back mm-hmm. makes the whole thing a lot easier. So just like prioritising, making sure you're still mm-hmm. passionate about what you're doing. Yeah, Otherwise, absolutely. What's the point? Absolutely. Because it's, it's like you were saying, Louise, like it's, um, it is hard if you're doing uh, a lot of different things. You've got a lot of different responsibilities and then your passion, unfortunately, ends up getting put to sort of the back of the queue, doesn't it? Um, sometimes, which is, which is a shame. Um, but that actually leads on to what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, you were saying that, Louise, that some certain people have different, you know, situations. Uh, they might have care responsibilities and things like that. They've got people that they need to um, that they need to earn money for, and it's not always it's not always easy. And that's something that that was covered in the um, in the report. Um, a, a particular point that I wanted to look at um, was a quote that said, "Social class was found above all else to influence young people's chances of earning money through music. Uh, those from lower lower income backgrounds were significantly less likely to be earning." money through music than those from higher income backgrounds, um, uh, which I think is really important. And there's a lot that we could cover on this topic, but something I think that specifically um, is interesting is that the the sort of who you know barrier, the networking barrier um, is experienced more acutely by those from lower income backgrounds. Um, So yeah, I wanted to sort of ask everyone really if they've, if, they how they've experienced accessing networking opportunities and how networking has affected you with your career um obviously if it's different if you're not a musician or you know you can sort of adjust it (laughs) to uh, your situation or what you've experienced but yeah um Bailey if you want to go first on that if that's all right (laughs) hi uh (laughs) networking um uh, <clears throat> yeah i think it's necessary i mean it was an interesting conversation i was i have a mentor at the well had a mentor called kazim and we were chatting about it and i think yeah it's slightly different in regional ways and we were talking about like partnerships especially for like organizations or collectives like radio stations and stuff like that and he was like yeah you know i was speaking to him about you know how partnerships come about for him and he's like oh yeah you know just kind of meet these people out and about and i was trying to explain to him like that doesn't really Mm -hmm. doesn't really happen in leeds in the same way um but yeah i don't don't know how much more i have to Mm -hmm. say on it like I don't know, it makes me extremely anxious, the idea of networking, but... Yeah, it's definitely... It's necessary. And also, I guess there's other different ways of doing it. Like, it doesn't have to be in, like, that kind of um, popular imaginary way of, like, chatting to someone and giving them, like, a business card at drinks. Like, people just hit yeah. people up on social media a lot nowadays, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that with the social media, maybe that's a reason why it's made it it might be the way that people can access networking opportunities that otherwise wouldn't get it from you know maybe their parents or friends of friends and that kind of thing um louise do you want to um say something on on that yeah i think it's funny isn't it i think when you leave when you leave education in particular it's about a change of mindset because you kind of go through school or college or university thinking that we live in a meritocracy and we don't, unfortunately. And mm-hmm. we're sort of sold this idea, if you work hard, good things will come. And that's true to some extent, um, but we see it in every kind of sort of facet of society that actually, you know, the... I'm trying to be really careful with my words, but basically, you know, if you if you come from a kind of wealthier background and your, your family are well-networked and that kind of thing, you know, it's easier to rise to the top than if you're, you know, you don't have those luxuries. And in some senses, I think it's easier in small cities. I know sort of Bailey said it, you know, maybe certain opportunities don't exist in Leeds, but George and I both kind of said before we went live, like, George and I know each other 
um I know his mum because I've worked with his mum like I know George because of his music like Newcastle is quite a small city and it's a little fishbowl and therefore most people working within a music or art scene you know they're only kind of you know two degrees away from somebody so I think if you are living in a smaller city and thinking you know or oh, everything's in London or everything's in the south or you know you're outside of like Manchester or Leeds and think oh everything's happening in the city Mm -hmm. you know look at it as a kind of little mini ecosystem and how you can kind of build your relationships within that within that smaller space and from there you can kind of venture out and out and out and out and out and build a slightly bigger kind of network um i mm -hmm. agree that the kind of formal sense of networking is is awful it's excruciating like i hated it you know for work if i was doing <laughs> a specific networking event or like a business breakfast or something they're horrible like nobody wants to <laughs> dish out a business card and walk up to somebody and kind of give a sales pitch um but the internet makes that a lot easier and events like this and the kind of things that you know music leads and Yorkshire Music Forum and come play with me run to, you know take advantage of that um but yeah it's no <laughs> it's, it's not an easy process um but I think mm -hmm. when people within the music industry in some senses it's easier because it's a shared passion people work in this industry because they love it and because they care about it so it's far easier to strike up a conversation that you can be engaged about and excited about when it comes to music than you would be yeah. if you were talking about like property or whatever like if that floats <laughs> you both then great but you know you're building on a passion so in that sense it should be easier um mm -hmm. but yeah going back to kind of the report um and a network and the information that's available to people um and I, we're probably going to touch a little bit more on kind of class and income but you know mm -hmm. ironically those from lower income backgrounds were more than twice as likely to be unaware of the funding opportunities available to support them mm -hmm. um you know young people from lower income backgrounds were less likely to be able to I think nearly half 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 as less likely half found it harder <laughs> oh yeah I get it <laughs> to access networking opportunities so it's it's a problem it's a sort of systemic problem mm -hmm. um, and something that needs to be broken down and I think like I say organizations like Music Leads and like Yorkshire Music Forum are kind of making it more accessible and making it easier mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely think that like the it's I think class is social class is definitely something that is a, that affects people's ability to to know about um about the networking opportunities that are out there. I mean, when I say networking, I kind of I, I do kind of mean the informal version because me myself I actually really I'm the same I can't do the formal one. I do, I'm very uh, incapable of that kind of thing. But um yeah like i think it's, it's there's definitely a disparity there um but like like you said you know yorkshire music forum and um come play with me and um music leads and launchpad and you know youth music they all provide opportunities for people and it's just maybe it's about getting getting the knowledge of these um com these organizations out there to people who aren't already in that bubble because it can be like a sort of yeah. a bubble you know it's, it can be quite um what's the word um I've lost the word but yeah a, a bubble, I think. Aren't it? yeah the only mm -hmm. other thing I mentioned sorry because I'm conscious I've been talking for quite a while but is right. like Bailey you mentioned mentors and I don't know how you found yours or how you kind of came in contact with yours but I think if you see somebody that works in the line of work that you're interested in or someone doing something that you're interested in approach them because people generally speaking like to you know if, if people think that other people think they're an authority on something um it's quite flattering don't be afraid to approach somebody and say look like I really like what you're doing or I'm really interested in what you're doing you know is there any kind of advice or guidance that you can you can offer me and generally I think people will oblige yeah definitely um, I'm just conscious of time so I was thinking of maybe just carrying on with that mentors thing because there's actually um a question that i want to talk about a sort of a topic i want to talk about um about sort of i think when it comes to approaching mentors sometimes it can be a bit intimidating um especially if if you don't feel represented um so 
you know, I've, from my personal experience, I've often, you know, been in in situations where I've been in, um, like, surrounded by sort of like music industry people, and it's often, you know, um, just men in the room or something like that. And it's which is fine, but um, you know, sometimes you don't feel necessarily that you've got that connection where you can just be like, hey, you know, we're from the same place or we're from the same environment. Um, can we chat? And so, first of all, like, I wanted to ask ev everyone, um, you know, have you yourselves um ever approached a mentor or worked with a mentor have you got someone that advised you and how did that help and then um i guess i'll ask the next question after but it's sort of relating to what i just said but um yeah shante have you um is there a mentor that you've worked with who's helped you in that sense um well i've worked with quite a few people who've like given me guidance and advice to get to where i am now because going back to the school thing i didn't have a clue going mm -hmm. in about funding or the opportunities and I think it's finding people who are willing to teach you rather than do mm -hmm. things for you because you it's best if you take control of your own career so you can take mm -hmm. control of your own direction and the saying about teaching mm -hmm. man to fish and he'll eat forever yeah it's true <laughs> I think yeah I no definitely it sounds like it's, it's helped <laughs> yeah. you out definitely and jo George have you um worked with um a mentor have you had has there been a mentor that's worked with you before oh you're just on mute <laughs> oh, sorry uh, right. no I've, ne I've never specifically had to go and seek out a mentor but I think that I think the same sort of thing applies uh when in in terms of networking because if, if you if you're wanting to find a mentor and a lot of the time that's necessary to develop within the industry um it's impossible to do that if, if within your circles uh, there's nobody who has any sort of particular connection uh and uh, it basically echoing what Louise was saying before but i think uh the issue extends particularly in the sort of rural towns uh not near cities people who are passionate about music in the industry who have no access to mentors i think i think that's a big problem and it's just like a systemic problem you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like as I was saying before um, about the whole the whole mental thing and having people to look up to in the industry um, I wanted to ask if um, how well the, the specific quote that was in the um, that was in the uh, report was that um, oh where is it lost it now um Um, okay, I've lost the quote, <laughs> but it was talking about how um, how people have struggled to find themselves represented in the industry, and that's why they've um, found found blocks towards um, sort of um, reaching out to people for advice. And so I wanted to put that out there to everyone um, how they feel represented, if at all, if at all, in the industry that, or the part of the music industry that they work in. Um, Leone, should we go to you first? Um, yeah, I I always find this question quite difficult to mm -hmm. answer or to deal with because obviously I know I'm a woman and that means I'm underrepresented in the music industry if you look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm a white middle class mm -hmm. woman. So a lot of the barriers that do exist didn't necessarily exist for me and I think my my barriers weren't necessarily that I felt like I didn't have access to the industry I think it was more knowledge different priorities when I was younger family not really not believing not not believing in me but more having their own background in not always having the financial security that they needed and pushing me Towards financial security rather than creativity and what I think maybe would have given me a happier life so yeah I never felt I never feel treated differently because I'm a woman in the industry um, but I guess that might also just have to do because with the fact that I went into the industry when I was a bit older um, I, I've always been on stage but I only started doing gigs independently and kind of fending for myself four years ago when I was 23, 24. So you come from a whole different perspective because you've kind of already formed a lot of your personality and formed a lot of your confidence. And uh, so you, you're not really 
taken aback by many many things men say I guess yeah <laughs> um yeah. and especially doing it in Sheffield like Sheffield is on the one hand a super super warm and welcoming environment and it re they really took me in straight away and you've got loads of open mic nights here and I never felt like I was not taken seriously on the other hand there's a proper lad culture in music mm -hmm. we all know this <laughs> um yeah. so you do kind of find yourself sometimes being the token woman on the lineup um and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff and I've always felt really uncomfortable with that position because I want to play gigs, I want to headline gigs because I'm good, not because I'm a woman. And mm -hmm. it's a really difficult balance to strike because I really understand that people in the industry want to do good, but there's different ways to do that, I guess. Um, yeah. It's not just by doing, oh, look at these amazing women in the Sheffield music industry. It's by mm -hmm. saying, look at these amazing artists. They happen to yeah. be um yeah so i i i've never really felt this the the kind of barriers that statistics show but mm -hmm. i'm really aware of people who have yeah yeah definitely um i agree with that that point about the um because it's tr it's tricky you you don't want to be chosen to do something based on your gender or based on you know how you fit into a certain um social group um but in the same time in the same breath you know it's, it's being done for a relatively positive reason um same question daily um do you feel like you're represented in your industry and um how important do you think representation is um for young creatives I feel like I'm never ready for your questions. I feel like I always think you're going to ask someone else. <laughs> I just I like to throw um, them in spontaneously and just catch you off guard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do I think about representation in the industry? Okay, so, yeah, I mean, I have a sticky re uh, relationship with representation. I mean, we started, me and Aura kind of were like, wanted to start uh, the radio station coming out of, like, um, education because... A, there wasn't that much in the city, but the, like the one kind of online radio there was was like super kind of like um, white boys mm -hmm. playing electronic music and there wasn't really much space for anything else within that. So yeah, I guess the aim, one of the aims of starting the radio was to try and like draw together some of the more um, diverse and marginalized communities within the city. Uh, that being said, maybe that was like a year and a half two years ago now i'm like less eager to like hang my hat on representation mm -hmm. i don't know if it's always the answer um i mean yeah it, it can depend like representation but doing what representation but in what role like um and i think oftentimes uh i don't know i'm thinking about like big music and arts institutions in the city that like may be like seen to be like I don't know diverse working with like a range of different marginalized communities but then if you looked at like their budget and the budget breakdown of like what's going towards that compared to like what's going towards everything else um yeah it would mm -hmm. kind of be pale in comparison and lastly I kind of yeah it kind of like mm, it's kind of perpetuated by like the funding like streams within this country and like you're looking at stuff like arts council when you look at the list of like mpos um which are like the people that get like money from arts council regularly and if you look at like yorkshire and i mean it's, i think it's like 10 million a year to opera north and then like the other like 20 music um organizations in the in the region barely make up like a million a year and it's the same with the kind of cultural recovery fund and i feel like oftentimes they just kind of like perpetuate um white supremacy by like giving the money to organizations that already do you know i mean mm -hmm. um yeah already are failing to like mm -hmm. engage with marginalized communities yeah so in terms of in terms of like where that funding should go what what do you think would be a better way to to invest in that because obviously you you started um with already the you know the sable and it's a it's a community organiza organization it's diy it's you know it's grassroots in it and one of the parts that was in the report was saying that 
the next sort of generation well i've got the actual quote here actually let's go for that instead <laughs> um so it said impatient for change this new wave has started cultivating their own grassroots movements increasingly we're seeing a generation take it upon themselves to be the change they advocate as the writer Rene, i can't say that name so i'm not going to say it because i don't want to offend anyone has pointed out these kind of collectives are creating their own rules and leading by example using their collective power to force changes to venues culture festivals and legislation rather than waiting for top-down action to happen so this question is you know to those like bailey you know who who run a collective um um have you managed to receive support or communication from businesses at the top and if not what kind of support would you like to see um so i guess i mean i, I don't know if any of the rest of you are involved in the same kind of organization so i'm going to put the question to bailey just because we're running out of time but um yeah, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, like, not enough, basically. Mm -hmm. There's not really enough support. I don't know if there's, like, I don't know if there's enough will for it. Obviously, um, I say that, and I've we've just got given, received money from a project from Youth Music, which is great, and similarly, mm -hmm. like, we're part of Launchpad. It looks so exciting, like, that one, by the way. That's the, is that the, the radio... Um, uh, yeah. sort of like an apprenticeship scheme thing yeah it looks great yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry carry on <laughs> uh and yeah i don't know but even even then and, and, I, and i don't want to like trivialize them but like these are quite like piecemeal um amounts of money or like projects in compared to like you know the grand scheme of things and you you know i could name off the like arts organizations in, in yorkshire that got like 700 800 grand from like a cultural recovery fund um so yeah i don't know I, it's a challenge um yeah I, I don't know if i have the answers on that one <laughs> <laughs> that's all right no worries um i think it's definitely probably something that needs to be built on definitely distributing money um towards different organizations that can, but I, can help and but but just kind on. of to add on it yeah so with like all of these kind of like government funds and stuff like the argument is always that there aren't enough of organizations that are like eligible or in a position to apply to these things, for example, cultural recovery or like don't fit MPO status. But you've also kind of got to look at that and say, OK, well, why are like why is there no like, I don't know, black led or like women led organizations doing this? And I think a lot of I think there should be more emphasis to like kind of redress those kind of things rather than just like the symptoms, because I think oftentimes then it just goes to like um predominantly white-led predominantly male-led um organizations that have the kind of diversity as an add-on um yeah and usually yeah. that yeah no that makes absolute sense um i'm just conscious of time so i just want to before we go to sort of like questions from um everyone who's i don't know if there's been any comments but um if we go to question before we go to questions i just wanted to ask if um everyone could sort of give me like their sort of vision of what they'd like to see um the music industries uh, be like um for emerging creatives like what they would if there's like one thing that they'd like to see more funding for or they'd like to see um uh, created um in schools or that kind of thing and if there's also any advice you can give to in creatives as well. So if we start with Louise, that's all right. Oh, big question. Um, I know. Two, things, <laughs> two things to speak to Bailey's point, and I think it's it's worth me sort of touching on as a funder, um, is this idea of collective responsibility. We as a funder and all funders have a responsibility to ensure that our money and public money is being fairly and proportionately distributed and a big part of that comes through consultation it comes through speaking to people it comes through identifying actually what are the you know where are the gaps where are the priorities in different regions because what you know what we need in London is going to be different to the West Mids is going to be different compared to Yorkshire and the makeup of people is going to be different in all of those places and a big part of this you know the blueprint report you know we consulted with 1,300 young people. We consulted with 100 or so organisations to find out exactly 
what it was that they felt like they wanted and they needed. And our response to that was was this incubator fund, which is, you know, the the fund that, that Bailey mentioned. And I think he's right. Like, it's not huge life-changing amounts of money at all. Um, but what it is, is that it's putting money back into the hands of young people. Um, and so talking about kind of what I want to see for the future, um, for Yorkshire, for the North East, obviously, in terms of where I come from, is to see more tangible, sustainable uh, career opportunities for young musicians and all the stuff that we've talked about in terms of the barriers that young people face. It's it's frustrating, really, but I think money is probably one of the biggest things that's going to help to to break down those barriers and to allow young people the opportunity to develop and learn so that at some point down the line, they're the people in these organisations delivering projects or making decisions about where money goes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I could I could talk, I could write a thesis on this, to be honest, but I think it's a case of people who can put their money where their mouth is and, you know, have youth music and other funders are, are a part of that, but ensuring that money is going, you know, to the people that it should be and ultimately benefiting young people to, to make a career out of music. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, George, any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, uh, for me, it's it's two or three things. I think one of the main things for me is access. Uh, I think one of the massive things that we've learned, especially over the pandemic, is that a lot of jobs that are advertised for only people who live in London uh, can be done remotely. So uh, mm-hmm. allowing people all up and down the country to get these jobs and have the access that they wouldn't normally have mm-hmm. is a huge thing. Um, I think curriculum change, learning about uh, the breadth of opportunities is a, is a massive thing because it, for, for me and I think everyone here it wasn't touched on in school at all. And then finally, it's it's a bit of a trickier one. I think it's important to change the perspective that um, I, I, I think Leonie touched on before that uh, being an artist is is considered more of a hobby and not something that's important or a credible uh, you know, life plan. I think if we can change that perception, then I think that's a really important thing, but that's obviously mm-hmm. a more challenging one. Yeah, I definitely will get there eventually, but yeah, it's one. <laughs> Shante, what are you thinking? Um, I think, like George, I think it starts with education. I think opportunities like Launchpad and Come Play With Me and all the other music charities are so important, but in a lot of the time, people who need them the most are never told about them. And, and so you don't, like, I didn't find these opportunities till this age. And I think if I'd have known about the support that I could have been offered from when I left school, like primary education, then your development would be so much easier and it saves you from being in like some sketchy situations like you was on about representation. Sometimes as a woman, you find yourself surrounded by men who say inappropriate things and you don't feel able to speak up. So I think, I think what I'd like to see is an industry where we all feel supported and surrounded by people where we, are able to talk so we know what's right from wrong and we all feel represented mm-hmm. yeah definitely um leonie same question um i'm gonna try to not repeat everyone else because <laughs> I, I i want loads of things that you guys have said um but yeah i think the main thing is it should start young i primary schools and high schools and just the educational system should reinstate the value of music and creative education and to start taking the role of creativity seriously for not just music but everything it's we we spend loads of time learning facts and figures and can't actually understand them because we're never taught to use that side of our thinking um and learning music and learning creativity and taking it seriously and adding it into our curriculum as a whole, I think will really help not just make people take the music industry more seriously and the creative industries, but also just create a different kind of workforce yeah. where everyone has loads of transferable soft skills and skills that they wouldn't normally have because you're not taught to think in a creative way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Education is, it's come up a few times, hasn't it? I think it's definitely going to be a big factor in the change. And Bailey, finally, what, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I kind of agree with what everyone else has said thus far. Um, education important. Um, but then I also think it needs to happen really in tandem, as kind of Louise was saying, in tandem with there being like viable careers mm -hmm. and money and paid opportunities to do stuff. Um, so like I know it's kind of across the arts, but like definitely in like online radio sphere, like it relies so heavily on like volunteer labor and it's kind of again like valorized and actually it just is a big barrier for people from low income backgrounds that you know don't have can't afford to just do six months like unpaid internship or going you know mm -hmm. after year after school can just spend a year just going around getting that experience so yeah i don't know uh, education is great but i just don't want a bunch of kids coming into into an industry that's got no money for them so. yeah <laughs> so, absolutely yeah. I definitely agree. And I mean, we could talk for ages on this, but we're running out of time. But I think definitely um, the importance of paying people for their work is is, is huge. Um, and I think I'd definitely personally like to see, as well as um, people learning more about the opportunities that are available throughout the country, not just in London. Personally, I'd love to also see um, people being uh, offered more paid work placements because I think that's definitely it's career boosting it's you know it means more people can get involved and obviously everyone needs money so, and it makes you feel good it makes you feel like you're actually a professional um so we are we have I think four minutes left so we've got one question um and that is are you able to suggest any specific resources to look at for young people who want to work in the music industry so we've only got a couple of minutes left so i'm going to put this to louise because i feel like you probably can throw a load of resources at us <laughs> so where would you suggest well luckily they're all in one place in terms of the things <laughs> i'm going to suggest um so the youth music website um is essentially now a hub of kind of information and content for young people um, looking to begin a career in the music industry. Lily obviously has contributed and we've got a pool of um, what we call our next gen, so our 18 to 25 roles who share information, tips, advice. We've got Q&As on there. Lily's done a brilliant one with uh, Tom McFarlane from Jungle. Uh, we have artists and um, sort of industry boards giving their advice as well. The other thing I would sort of be really mindful of is to look at the opportunities that are available in your area so um, there's a map on the youth music website of youth music funded projects um, if we're talking specifically kind of Yorkshire based you're probably in the right place in terms of um, <laughs> access to the Yorkshire Music Forum um, you know to music needs to come play with me to hire rhythm to kick out the you know the full works there's, there's so many different projects there who are offering you know advice and support um and a network of people who can who can help um yeah youth music website youth music network and i guess the uh the what are the calls the logos across the bottom of the page are probably all good websites to go to as well yeah definitely i'm just having a look now at them and um i've worked with music leads and they're amazing complain with me amazing youth music obviously sick um <laughs> you know everyone everyone there's so many opportunities and i think um even after just speaking to everyone today it's it's uh it's looking like we've got some good people going into the industry going forward so fingers crossed things are going to be where we want them to be so um yeah uh before we go i want to thank all of the funders um for funding this uh this this panel um that i think i've mentioned them before but um we've got um We've got oh, oh, um, BPI, uh, Youth Music, of course. Um, we've got uh, PRS Foundation and National Lottery, Arts Council England, Leeds 2023, Arts Leeds, Leeds City Council through, your, uh, through Launchpad. Um, so yeah, make sure that if you uh, are available over the next couple of days that you um, that you tune into the rest of the, the chats that are happening because they're really useful. Um, hopefully this one's been useful. It's been really interesting for me. Um, it's really, really nice to speak to you guys. Um, and uh, it sounds like you're all doing really interesting things. And thanks Louise for, for hopping on this with us and giving us lots of information about what you can do with youth music. Definitely recommend anyone who is wanting to get into music uh, gets involved with them because done really good things for me and I'm sure for you guys um so yeah watch the rest of the, the events and um big thanks to 
to Yorkshire Music Forum and Launchpad for putting this together. And I think that that is us done. So thanks. And uh, yeah, lovely to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you.